Bismillah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, hello and welcome. This is Badr Din, the mediator of webinar. Actually, I would like to thank uh, Asia Middle East Forum to give me this chance to invite me to moderate this webinar. Asia Middle East Forum is a pioneering platform for an ASEAN Middle East Middle Eastern dialogue. The forum aims to establish new relations and reinforce those in, uh, in existence through providing opportunity and uh, uh, effective communication, effective communication for those interested in both sides. The forum was established in June 2016 and based on Turkey. Please join me to in welcome in welcoming our speakers, Dr. Malik Ayub Simbel, Dr. Daniel uh, Azman, uh, uh, Muhammad Daniel Azman, future Dr. Muslim Amran, Mr. Adam bin Sayyid. I'm, I'm blessed to have you here. Exist about all the token and present president that we are going to have today. Uh, uh, brother and sister, now before we begin, let me remind that this webinar will be a recorded and live on Asia Middle East Forum Facebook page. Uh, let's begin with the continue of the growing rise of China in severe fields. China and U.S. relations have witnessed many different changes. It made the U.S. administration adopt more than one strategy to contain or combat with China. These strategies witnessed a great difference between the Obama era and the Trump era. So, uh, however, the rise of China has increased the intensity of competition in the international sense. Also, this affected many regions around the world, such as Middle East. So in this meeting today, we will talk about discussion. Uh, we will talk and discussion that the future of US-China relation in the Biden era and its impact on Middle East. Uh, today in our webinar, today we have four speakers, 10 minutes for each and 20 to 30 minutes for discussion at the end of webinar. So we start with Dr. Daniel, Mohammed Daniel Azman to talk about the US-China relation during the Trump era. <coughs> Let me uh, make a quick introduce to Dr. Daniel. Dr. Daniel, Mohammed Daniel Azman is a senior lecturer in Faculty of Arts and Social Science, University of Malaya. He obtained his PhD in international relations from UK 2015 his teaching, research, his teaching, research, and publication interests are on the Africa-Asia relations, foreign policy, peace, and conflict studies. Dr. Daniel, most welcome. A time and mic is yours. Go ahead, Doctor. Thank you very much to the organizer and to the host, Badar. I wish uh, to say very good afternoon to fellow friends in uh, Jerusalem as well as in Turkey and good night or evening in Malaysia. Uh, so we are talking a very interesting topic about US and China. Uh, we are very lucky and fortunate because we are living in the present of the history where we witness a lot of these events uh, within our conversation, allowing us to be very familiar with the topics. Uh, but we have to put things into perspective so we will have a clear idea. So if we put very in a simple context, uh, that the whole decades of US-China relation is often can be summarized within a domain of hate-love relations because of many events. Whether we like it or not, it is something that shaped and reshaped uh, major events that happen in the international system. Uh, in the way that we want to see, there is a strong position whether there is a leader that leading of this system, so-called reassertiveness of global leadership uh, in this so-called security and political vacuum. And therefore, it would be wrong to assume that intensity of tensions only occurred uh, during the times of US under Trump in 2016, when he came to power, as well as China under Xi Jinping in 2013, when he uh, came to power and eventually subsequently initiated his famous BRI, Bell and Road Initiative. Their reason should be taken into considerations, uh, 
since Trump came to power in 2016, particularly because we are focusing on the US after Trump. Uh, first is geopolitics and economics uh, in locating a placement of China's uh, grand project of Belt and Road Initiative, uh, because for the first time it extended not only to many parts or cities of Asia, but including Middle East, Africa, and certain parts of Asia Minor and Europe. That include Turkey, Middle East, and North Africa within that uh, grand chessboard of politics and economy. And this is something that has been built upon decades of uh, the rise of China since 1970s, and now beyond Asia in particular. Uh, reasons number two, we have to look at the domestic politics of the US. Uh, when Trump came to power in 2016, uh, we believe we heard this a lot, MAGA, make America great again, or America come first, which has become a very strong rhetoric to suggest that there is a need to focus on America, at least from Trump's perspective of US foreign policy in many ways, uh, to propose a solution that the US could be better. Uh, if the U.S. reduce its global commitment and focusing so much on blaming a lot of the problems that the people occurred or happens because of the way uh, the U.S. dealing with a lot of partners. And that brings China into the context and perspective. So in reducing the commitment, Trump's hijacked the existing U.S. security, uh, in particular with dealing of China after 2013, the BRI, and this translated into a trade war which I think we have been recently heard a lot, in particular of the US and China trade war. So talking about the tensions and conflicts between the China and US, it has existed long, but Trump took it to the next level and moved into domain of uh, recent trade war. And when we arrive at the early year of 2020, we are now in the midst of the ongoing pandemic, COVID-19, and that was later translated into a domain of uh, pandemic and health securities. In particular, we are witnessing the US is withdrawing under crown from WHO, whereas uh, China is playing a part. But of course, we can criticize that it doesn't simply China is committing to World Health Organization uh, in terms of transparency of the reports and investigation on the origin of the, the issues of the pandemics and uh, in particular in helping uh, the international societies uh, at the cooperation levels about uh, building the vaccination at that level. So what we could see so far, the pattern is there is already tensions uh, in US and China, but later taken by Trump under the pretext of domestic issues of the US. Uh, interestingly though, we also have to acknowledge that there is a lot of problems domestically with China uh, from various spectrum and aspect, but rarely focused. Uh, part of the reason because of people are highlighting the positive outlook of China in terms of the BRI, but of course recently been subject to many criticisms and debate. Uh, secondly, uh, there is a lot of uh, negative image already by the US and compared to China, in particular of the way uh, US is dealing uh, with many issues, not just in Middle East, but uh, many parts of the world uh, when, when, when in contrast to China. But it doesn't mean uh, there is always a clear translation that the US is always bad, whereas the China is always good, uh, given the context of this uh, comparison in, in many ways. Uh, so since the demands of Obama, uh, there is always a greater question, what is the direction of the U.S. Uh, since that period? Uh, there is a popular depiction of the U.S. pivot in security is withdrawing from the Middle East, in particular since the demise of the Arab Spring predicament, and moving to China because of the competition with the BRI and so on. Uh, but, it, uh, but it doesn't guarantee that China will have an easy opportunity and platform to be in the Middle East in particular. Uh, given that period. So when Trump came to power, uh, the focus is actually to take what has been left and moving and eventually created more difficulties uh, for the US to move forward uh, because of the personality of Trump's, which cannot be confirmed to the traditional uh, perspective and reading of the US foreign policy. Uh, China might show some sign, but again, it's still very difficult given so many difficulties. So in a way, COVID-19, if I would like to end my speech now, uh, is a blessing in these guys. Uh, there is some commitment made by China, but there are some setbacks by the US. 
But in again, uh, it spill over the conflict and intensification to that level in particular. Yeah, that would be my overview of the US-China under Trump. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thanks for your uh, uh, commentary. Thanks for your statement. Uh, our participant, please, if there are uh, any questions and comments, please keep it for the uh, discussion section at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much. Now we move to a second speaker, future doctor, Muslim Imran. Muslim Imran is... Muslim Imran is a Palestinian academic and activities based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He obtained his bachelor degree in engineering from the International Islamic University, Malaysia, and his master's degree in political science, IR, from the same university. He shares the Palestinian Cultural Organization Malaysia. He is head of Southeast Asia Disc in the Afro Asian Council, and and is a, he is a member of several international groups. He has published a book on the politics of Middle East, and he writes uh, 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 opinion articles on the Palestinian issue and other international affairs. Muslim is currently completing his PhD program on strategies and international studies at the University of Malaya with this is on Malaysian foreign policy. Brother Muslim, uh, time and I might is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, brother. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, go directly to uh, the discussion. Um, the ongoing uh, rivalry between the US and uh, China uh, continues to draw attention uh, all over the world. Um, the Middle East, uh, being one of the most contested areas in the world, uh, is certainly not an exception. But uh, uh, the conflict and uh, uh, rivalry between the two uh, superpowers does not start there. Compared to uh, the U.S. relations with other uh, superpowers like Russia, where there are many issues, uh, ho many hotspots and issues of uh, uh, conflict that are uh, related in a way or another to the Middle East. China, on the other hand, uh, has uh, uh, several uh, points of uh, uh, tension uh, with the U.S., but mainly in its uh, vicinity. Uh, let me start my uh, presentation by uh, highlighting a question that many uh, American commentators have been raising uh, recently. They are talking about uh, China as uh, a rising uh, giant, which will unseat the United States from global hegemony. So they, they tend to ask, um, uh, will China be? Uh, will China dominate the 21st uh, century, uh, or when will China dominate the 21st uh, century? Uh, looking at numbers, of course, uh, for many Americans, it's frightening. In 2006, the American, the, the Chinese GDP, uh, nominal GDP was um, uh, three uh, trillion. Uh, American dollars in 2019, it's 14 trillion. It, it almost uh, 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 grew by five times. The American GDP in the same period uh, was 14 trillion, and it's uh, now about uh, 21 trillion dollars. So it did not even double in the same period. So this brings a lot of worry in the United States in particular. But uh, I would say that the, the more important question or more accurate question should not be the, uh, that will China dominate the 21st century as, uh, for instance, Jonathan Fenbei uh, wrote uh, as a book title. The question should be, does China really want to uh, unseat the United States? Does China really want to uh, dominate uh, the world? This question, uh, uh, I think, deserves uh, more attention. Uh, now, Lee Kuan Yew, the former uh, Singaporean Prime Minister, uh, the late uh, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, answered this question and said that the Chinese are in no hurry uh, to displace the United States as the world's uh, number one power uh, and to carry the burden that is part and parcel of such position. Um, well, at least until this point of time, the, the Chinese uh, publicly do not talk about uh, unseating the United States from world hegemony. They uh, tend to portray themselves uh, more as a developing uh, country and uh, they try to still keep a low profile. But China's continuous rise, 
um, uh, and America's perceived uh, diminishing global power uh, or perceived decline, of course, beg the question uh, that uh, how, how long would it be until China and the US uh, really uh, come to, to uh, a point of uh, no return and, and clash in a way or another? Um, the Chinese continue to rise and we have seen throughout the, the year 2020, one of the, the toughest years for world economy where the world economy sh shrank by 3%. We've seen that China continued to, continue to actually grow. Its economy grew by 1% while the United States economy uh, shrank by 6%, minus six compared to China's growth. Uh, so um, at one point of time, there will be a, 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 a and a, a need for the uh, Americans to uh, address the situation. Now, uh, before President uh, Xi Jinping come to power in uh, China uh, through uh, assuming the Secretary General's post in the party in 2012, and then later the presidency in 2013, uh, before him, China's uh, agenda has been predominantly economic. They have um, uh, strictly uh, worked on achieving economic development uh, and in, uh, on increasing their GDP. But uh, Xi Jinping comes with um, uh, a more confident foreign policy. He has made China more assertive on the international uh, arena. Uh, he uh, came with some uh, strategic uh, plans uh, that are now in uh, position. One of them is, uh, of course, uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, which was launched in 2013, and one of them uh, is the recently signed uh, RCEP, the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which was uh, signed by five, 15 countries, ASEAN plus five countries, including China, in November 2020 during the ASEAN uh, Virtual Summit uh, in Vietnam. Um, the OBOR initiative itself is um, a tremendous, uh, unprecedented infrastructure project in which four to eight a trillion dollars will be spent on investments and infrastructure across the world in at least 70 countries, giving China uh, the upper hand in many parts of uh, the world. So these two strategic uh, initiatives, uh, coupled by the failure of the US to actually uh, uh, bring in uh, some meaningful uh, economic uh, as well as political leadership in the world, especially during the time of Trump, these uh, uh, initiatives certainly give a signal that China is starting to flex its muscles. Uh, coupled by uh, growth in the military uh, its spending, in uh, its uh, military and uh, uh, naval uh, expansions in the sea, and in its technology uh, development, uh, I believe that uh, the uh, Chinese uh, are now um, uh, proving to be a real strategic uh, challenge for the United States. Uh, in order to, um, and I'll try to be brief, in order to look at the Chinese-American uh, uh, relationship uh, in the, the, the Biden era, I would uh, suggest that we look at uh, John Mersheimer's uh, perspective, John Mersheimer's uh, uh, analytical uh, model, um, if, if, if we may call it. Um, Mersheimer advanced uh, offensive realism, um, which, uh, um, believes that a superpower should seek absolute hegemony in order to survive, in order to protect uh, its uh, interests. And uh, the United States has been trying to do so. Now, since it's impossible to achieve absolute hegemony all over the world, because that requires a lot of capacities, um, any hegemon has to achieve regional hegemony. So the United States succeeded uh, in achieving that since uh, its uh, victory in the 1898 Spanish-American War, um, they controlled the Western Hemisphere. And ever since they controlled the Western Hemisphere, they have been able to flex their muscles internationally and to dominate the world. They um, uh, consequently tried to undermine and successfully undermine four other competing powers over the course of the last century. The Imperial uh, German uh, uh, power, was undermined in, uh, in the First World War. The uh, Japanese uh, imperial uh, power was undermined. The Nazi Germany, uh, Nazi Germany was undermined, as well as the Soviet Union, the most recent um, uh, US ca casualty in uh, world domination. So uh, 
the U.S. has been successful in this game. Uh, they dominated the Western Hemisphere and they continue to dominate certain regions, at least Europe, the Middle East, uh, and of course the Western Hemisphere. Now, uh, in order to continue to dominate the world, according to the same um, uh, logic, they have to undermine the Chinese power. Uh, whether they like it or not, whether the Chinese invest so much in the, the U.S. or not, to continue to dominate the world, and it's a role that the U many U.S. decision makers enjoy to play, in order to continue to dominate, they have to undermine the Chinese. Uh, now, Obama uh, realized this, and in order to achieve such uh, uh, success in his uh, containment of the uh, Chinese uh, rising power, uh, he advanced the pivot uh, policy uh, in 2010, and uh, he promoted the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, in, uh, in the same period, uh, a, a trade deal that was uh, everybody except China, basically, um, but which was later uh, 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 repealed by President Trump. So Obama approached China through the lenses of containment. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a Cold War uh, style of... Uh, uh, you know, um, approaching the other uh, rivals. While Trump was more uh, harsh and uh, uh, realized that one of the areas of uh, conflict was uh, trade relations, so he uh, pushed uh, a trade war because there was a real deficit and imbalance in trade between the U.S. and uh, China, $505 billion of Chinese exports to the U.S. At the same time, the U.S. was exporting $135 billion, uh, and we're talking about the year 2017, so... Trump realized that something had to be done, in addition to many accusations by the Americans and their allies that the Chinese have been uh, stealing American technology, acquiring companies, etc. So uh, they pushed uh, hard in this uh, direction through trade war, but they missed out on what Obama started. Obama started um, a, a very, um, a, I would say, a cunning and smart policy in uh, China's vicinity in China's neighborhood. Now, um, Biden has to uh, choose uh, course. And uh, I do believe that he will combine both Obama's and Trump's policies in his approach toward China. Uh, he has been careful in his statements about uh, China, of course, but uh, eventually the US uh, will be in a position where it tries to uh, restrict China's uh, growth. Now, China has to watch out, of course. If China wants to continue to rise and dominate its region, which is a more bumpy, more difficult region compared to the US, um, uh, China needs to address certain problems. Internally, there are, I would say, workable problems, which it can uh, um, uh, work out by itself. For instance, the uh, corruption, administrative corruption, an aging population, uh, lagging technology and innovation, and uh, of course the uh, the uh, rigidity of a one-party uh, st state-controlled political system. Uh, these are internal problems with the, which the Chinese uh, decision makers, intellectuals, and, and leaders have been discussing and thinking uh, about solving over the course of the past uh, decades. Um, and these problems won't really um, uh, be affected that much by external uh, intervention. But the bigger geostrategic problems are the ones that uh, uh, lay uh, beyond the, the sphere of, uh, of politics and uh, population. It's uh, the problems of um, uh, Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, two regions, two districts, which um, uh, continue to have uh, persistent uh, um, uh, self-determination aspirations, etc., which makes it difficult for China to, to keep things intact, although it's trying very hard. Uh, a volatile pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong now, which is uh, in one way or another in one supported minute. by the U.S. I'll, I'll try to briefly Please. conclude. Um, uh, in addition to that, the Taiwan issue, which might be the mother of all problems for China, Taiwan, uh, clearly started to manifest uh, its uh, intention to, to, to you know, uh, seed away from the, the Chinese uh, uh, state, and uh, the U.S. is is helping in all by all means possible in, in uh, achieving that. And we all remember uh, 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 Trump's phone call to the ta Taiwanese president, which uh, provoked the Chinese so much. Biden will continue in the same course, probably in in, in different ways, though. Um, 
China has 14 neighbors, many having problems. The most recent is Myanmar, now currently having uh, serious internal problems after the military coup in February uh, 1st. Um, it has borders with Afghanistan, which is which continues to be a hotspot. It has borders with volatile uh, countries like North Korea and others. It has also uh, rivalries with its neighbors. In fact, some of its neighbors see it as a bigger threat than the US see it. Japan, for instance, there are border disputes over some islands in addition to historical enmity and rivalry. India, which continues to have uh, in recent days border disputes with China, um, uh, and the South China Sea, which uh, is a minefield full of uh, conflicts and disputes with uh, the region. So China has to watch out for all of these uh, issues in order to continue to rise. If it is to consider or think about a global hegemony, or even uh, if it is to think about uh, a, a multipolar system, it has to address these problems or it will succumb to uh, its uh, own uh, uh, problems. I'll, I'll touch more on uh, the rivalry between the two states, uh, between uh, China and the US uh, uh, in the Middle East in the coming uh, session, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother Muslim. Uh, thanks for your uh, commentary. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, as I said, thanks. If there are any uh, question and uh, comment, please keep it for the last uh, section. Uh, now we move to Dr. Ayub, uh, Dr. Malik, sorry. Dr. Malik is uh, still with us. Dr. Malik. Uh, yeah, yeah, stay. okay. Okay, Dr. Malik. Dr. Malik, uh, do you have me, Dr. Malik? Uh, just a minute waiting for Dr. Malik. Uh, brother, I just have just a minute waiting for Dr. Malik. Uh, I try to ask him to join us. Yeah, I can begin early while we're waiting. Okay, last, last, last time. Mm. Okay, if there are a problem with the connection with Dr. Malik, please we can move to Brother uh, Mr. Adam bin Sayyid, uh, at the third speakers for uh, our webinar today. Brother uh, Adam bin Sayyid, he is a, a investigative journalist and at the TRT world and the former uh, senior manager of the strategy at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum. Adam is also public speaker and debater and senior patron at the Starton Constituent Group. Please, uh, Brother Adam, 
in 10 minutes, uh, 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 mic and time is yours. Go ahead. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was very happy to be invited today to a uh, session on such an important issue because often when we're looking at China-US ties, we neglect um, discussion of the Belt Road Initiative, which is, in my opinion, one of the most successful uh, systemic pieces of soft power influence. Uh, what we have to realize is that China has for a long time wanted to be involved in the Middle East. It's, she's been involved in the Middle East in a matter of speaking. But um, the penalty of involvement has not been paid by China more often than not because of its uh, BRI approach. But if we can just backtrack for a second, I, I want to lead with some facts that I'm sure uh, some of the experts here are familiar with. Um, when we discuss the ties of China to the Middle East, uh, we're discussing de facto deep roots that have been in place for a very long time now. I'm not talking historically, but in the modern era. Uh, China is the largest trade partner for most Middle Eastern countries. I'm not sure when exactly that's happened, but it's been happening for a long time. It trades with uh, at least 11 Middle, Middle Eastern North African countries, 10 Arab League nations, and Iran, which we'll get to uh, momentarily. And uh, I believe as, as recently as uh, 2018, the total volume of trade was 240 billion US dollars. Um, Trade with Iran and Turkey alone and Israel is something in excess of $70 billion. Um, so it's, it's quite a hefty amount that's, that's going on. Um, in addition to this, China is also the leading foreign direct investment uh, actor in the Middle East. And it's uh, financing major mega projects that are not only supporting regimes um, there by giving them legitimacy and, and, and funding, but also opening doors in terms of its... Uh, it has a very obvious like, demographic employment problem in mainland China. So a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs are finding their fortunes in the Middle East. Um, and I can give you examples. Uh, for instance, Algeria, which is traditionally considered one of the most closed off Arab nations in the Middle East, has a plethora of uh, Chinese entrepreneurs, construction companies, outfits, and they're doing well there. And then there's a technological uh, side to it as well. The uh, level of technology sharing between Middle Eastern companies, uh, Middle Eastern countries, sorry, and China has actually reached a strategic level. And we see this in the uh, defense trade and the technology sharing that occurs between Gulf countries and the Middle East. Um, we did an investigative uh, piece on this, exposing this, but uh, there is an intersection of Israeli uh, surveillance and hacking companies, okay? And, such as Dark Matter, which is an UAE NSA group, and you have Pegasus and a bunch of these companies that are buying technology, mass surveillance technology, from major Chinese firms um, under the auspices of smart city technology and whatnot. But uh, it's, it's incredible. And we actually found that some of the source code that was used in mass surveillance in the UAE, for instance, was applied to the Uyghurs in China. So... Uh, to say that China isn't taking a side, again, is something that I look on with a lot of reservation. Um, there's nearly a million Chinese expatriates um, throughout the Middle East. And uh, China remains one of the biggest global importers of petroleum oil, nearly half of which comes from the Middle East. And uh, LNG natural gas from the Gulf accounts for nearly 80% of China's trade. So there's, there's quite a bit going on. And um, this... If we can just take a pause here and reflect on something, there is a Yale scholar, John Lewis Gaddis, in his book on grand strategy, where he talks about the alignment of potentially um, infinite aspirations with necessary limited capabilities. And there's very few countries in the world, superpowers, I mean, or great powers, that are able to balance the ideological side and the finite opportunities in front of them when dealing with so much, and this challenge is, is um, amplified when it comes to great nations like China. So when we look at China, not only is it dealing with a civilizational heritage that um, gives it the mandate, so to speak, to, uh, to be the top tier country that it believes itself to be, but also as Brother Muslim mentioned, it's dealing with an incredible number of challenges, contested areas, domestic issues, and, and so on. So to see China's performance in the Middle East um, is to see reflection of uh, cold strategic intent. As I said, they have managed to, um, I wouldn't say infiltrate because the doors are quite open to them, 
but they have managed to integrate themselves in the Middle East and, and reach that level of strategic rapprochement that benefits their interests without the penalties. And I'll give examples of this uh, momentarily. Uh, primarily, we have the uh, China-Iraq deal, uh, China-Iran deal, sorry, which occurred in, I believe, in 2020, June of 2020. And um, while the entire amount has not been paid, it's in excess of hundreds of billions of dollars. So obviously, this is a very sensitive issue for the U.S. and the new upcoming Biden administration, as they seek to find ways to reinstitute the old nuclear deal and put pressure on Iran which is arguably less pressured uh, when it has a major ally such as China. And uh, interestingly enough, and I, I, I would love to hear insights about uh, what is it about Chinese foreign policy and diplomacy that makes this possible. Um, you don't see these uh, cost benefit penalties paid in terms of the different approaches taken to Sunni and Shia in the Middle East. So you have um, major Hezbollah offshoots, for instance, uh, talking about their solidarity with China as a partner. You have great ties between China and Iran, at least through the BRICS framework. But in spite of that, when you look at uh, the traditional Sunni uh, monarchs or uh, republics, relations with China are nonetheless um, unaffected, more or less, in spite of the fact that Iran and Israel are obviously major issues of foreign policy for them. Um, so for instance, the Uyghur issue has all but uh, been uh, it has all it's been put on the back burner for a lot of countries, including countries like uh, Turkey. Uh, Saudi Arabia was never really critical in the first place, and we saw an amazing visit between um, Hamid bin Salman and uh, Xi Jinping, and it just sort of reinforced this. So the point that I'm trying to get here is that uh, to get to here is that China has an incredibly intelligent and dynamic foreign policy when it comes to the Middle East. Um, I'm not want to immediately take up the labels that have been thrown by the New York Times as the new uh, new colonial exploitation of Africa and whatnot. I genuinely believe they're only acting in their self-interest. And I also don't think that China is trying to um, upstage the US as a hegemon, because as uh, Brother Muslim mentioned, there is a significant price associated with being the hegemon. And even if we're looking at it in terms of hegemonic stability theory, um, China isn't at a place now where it can easily upseat and upstage the U.S. and it brings a lot of problems. So instead, it's focusing on the vacuum left behind by the U.S. in, in the Middle East. Uh, China's involvement in African countries, for the most part, the uh, first major construction projects that's happened in Africa only occurred in countries with very minimal U.S. presence. And it was then that that, that uh, was sort of expanded and, and, and grown on. Um, I think in terms of the Middle East as well, there's deep ambivalence uh, towards China. Aside from moral humanitarian grounds, um, any Middle Eastern regime will tell you that I'd rather be a friend to the U.S. than to China. So it's not exactly a repeat of the Cold War's uh, non-aligned movement or uh, picking parties and, and choices. The U.S. is still the ideal uh, partner in the region. But China offers uh, Middle Eastern nations a chance to benefit both from the U.S. Uh, formal counterterrorism ties and, and military support while reaping considerable economic benefits and financing on the other front. So in a way, it, it's completely, it doesn't make it a condition that you have to drop the U.S. to be allies with me. I, mean, I think this is incredibly intelligent for countries that are suffering with regular budget uh, deficits and, again, the lack of liquid capital to make these mega projects that would reinforce the legitimacy in the eyes of their people again. Um, this example isn't just limited to the Middle East. We see this in, um, uh, in, in uh, the subcontinent. We see it specifically in the Maldives, for instance. And it seems to be a model that is systemic and institutional that is uh, repeated time and time again. Um, for me, the interesting part is um, the uh, securitization of uh, Chinese involvement in the Middle East. I'm very curious as to when it began. And uh, more specifically, uh, the implications for the uh, for regional ties, for the clustering of regional ties and regional security complexes in the Middle East, how is that affected with the role of China? Because China does have a military angle in, in the Middle East, and not just talking about resources, but its presence on the ground has actual military ramifications. And the best example of this is, frankly, Iran. Uh, when we look at um, the uh, area, the anti-access and area denial strategies, military tactics that are used by China in the uh, Southeast uh, Asian Sea, uh, the Spratly Islands, and uh, those used by Iran, again, in a very small contested space, the uh, 
military principles are very much the same and the results of obvious military cooperation and, and, and sharing of ideas. The idea that the U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier, this multi-billion dollar, is only as weak as uh, a cheap $20,000 missile, $20, missile that can take it down is very much, it's fundamentally uh, Chinese military doctrine at the heart of it. Um, so I'm very interested to see how this plays out. I expect to see uh, China taking a more uh, nuanced approach, sectarian-wise, in terms of uh, sponsoring groups on the ground that uh, meet its direct economic interests. I think it hasn't reached that level, but it's the uh, natural sort of progression. I also think that China will manage any effect, any, any move it makes in the Middle East, with something that um, it's, all, it's frankly mastered, the mastering of the sub-threshold, the low conflict intensity moves that don't trigger a major opponent into reacting or overreacting, it's things that can be slowly brushed away until before you know it, you have islands that are built in the middle of the South China Sea with sovereignty claimed therein. So that's my general take on it. And um, again, I think that this is an issue that is deeply underestimated especially among uh, think tanks and analysts in the Middle East, uh, mainly for the reason that China, unlike its immediate neighbors, isn't seen as a direct threat. The uh, Middle Eastern perception compared to, for instance, that of India, is, is uh, the Indian one is existential. Um, if you look at China, for instance, being able to cut the Silk Road corridor in, in uh, Doklam, in Bhutan, that would immediately cut off access to 90 million people Absolutely. living in, in, in North India. So China does have... Uh, the same, it's the same China that's in the Middle East, but uh, threat perceptions, for better or for worse, are not immediately triggered by it. And I think that's uh, part of the Chinese strategy in the Middle East. Um, in terms of the U.S., it's my frank opinion that there's not much the U.S. can do, given that it conceded a lot of the territory, a lot of these places, to China when it took a smaller posture and a smaller footprint in the area. Uh, we can expect the usual saber-rattling, but for much of these initiatives that are already on the ground and have already begun yielding fruit and, and building things on the ground and credit is being repaid. It's an ecosystem, it's an infrastructure that's very much up and active, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. That's, uh, that's all for me, I think, for now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Adam Ben Sayed. Thank you so much for your statement and your, your uh, comment. Thank you so much. Uh, we are trying to connect again with Dr. Uh, Malik, but unfortunately, uh, we couldn't. Uh, I don't know exactly. Brother Ahmed, if there are any chance to Dr. Malik join us again. He is not allowed. Uh, he just WhatsApp me. Just a minute, he called me by phone. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Mr. Badr, uh, mute. We can't hear you, Mr. Badr. Mr. Badr, uh, you are mute. Uh, so sorry, so sorry. Actually, I'm trying to uh, talk with Dr. Uh, Malik. Uh, he tried, but he couldn't, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, now, inshallah, we move to Dr. Uh, 
Mohammed Makram Balawi, uh, President of the Asia Middle East Forum, to, uh, in short uh, words, to thank our uh, participants and uh, uh, speakers. Please go ahead, Doctor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum as Thank you very much for um, taking part in this very important uh, webinar. I think it's a great start. Although we were uh, focusing on other issues uh, lately, but I think uh, the most important issue now is the Chinese rise. Although, in my opinion, we most of us are affected by uh, the American narrative, especially uh, that we study international relations uh, from a Western point of view. So, most probably, our uh, analysis is always affected with that uh, approach. So usually we tend to repeat uh, the uh, Western theory, but we know almost nothing about the Chinese narrative, which is actually makes us a uh, very uh, uh, curious about what the Chinese says about themselves which is more scientific and uh, at the same time more uh, objective. Uh, in that case, uh, I think we have to study the Chinese rise from uh, different point of views. Maybe in the near future, inshallah, we will uh, invite some Indian maybe speakers to tell us their opinions as long as we are not able to reach the Chinese themselves, at least uh, Let's have uh, uh, a bigger point of view. Um, inshallah, also, we have the magazine, Asia, uh, Asia Post, and we are hopeful that all of you could uh, take part with us and maybe send us your articles, your views. Uh, that would uh, be uh, very much of help, and we could uh, all the time discuss things from uh, an open-minded uh, view. And uh, finally, thank you very much and hope to see you again, uh, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, now we reach for the uh, discussion and uh, question and answer section. Please, if there are any question, uh, go ahead directly. Uh, Brother Muslim, as you said, uh, I think there are something you want to discuss. Um, yes, thank you. I will try to also uh, relate the, the points I still want to raise to the question that I read here by uh, uh, Mr. Saddam. Uh, he's asking, taking into account the nuclear weapons in both the U.S. and China, which created a threatening balance between them, and also Mersheimer's statement that China has become a new pole in the world. Will we witness a new Cold War between the two poles, and will the manifestations of this war extend beyond the military to the cyberspace, uh, perhaps medical, etc.? Um, okay, before uh, uh, carrying on on the points I, I wanted to to raise, I would like to say that uh, we will witness a more dangerous uh, situation than the Cold War. The Cold War, uh, uh, the system that had two uh, major uh, superpowers, um, was in a way or another well calculated, especially after the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis. Um, there was no um, uh, all out war between the two uh, uh, poles and uh, uh, although the ideological, uh, ideological war and uh, uh, conflicts uh, across the world continued, but both uh, superpowers were uh, very careful, especially with the nuclear uh, uh, assets that they had. But we are moving towards a multipolar, multipolar system in, in a way or another, and that is more messy and more dangerous. Uh, assuming um, that uh, Russia, for instance, is going to stand behind China and uh, be a part of the Chinese ally alliance is very premature. Russia is a superpower by its own with military capabilities that are far uh, more uh, 
advanced and sophisticated than the Chinese uh, themselves. Yes, they have uh, issues with the economy, but mil military speaking, they are still uh, power to reckon with. Uh, and uh, the, the free world might not necessarily also uh, line up behind the United States in, in such uh, a messy uh, international conflict. You look at the European attitude after the COVID crisis towards China. The Americans have been uh, crying out loud to the Europeans not to uh, move forward with, with their economic pacts with the Chinese, but they, the Europeans do need the Chinese uh, 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 financial and economic inputs uh, dearly. So uh, we're talking about a more complicated world than the one that uh, uh, the, the two superpowers uh, ran uh, decades ago. The, the, the second issue I wish to highlight is what I, I was uh, illustrating just now. Uh, Mr. Adam also touched on uh, China's presence in the Middle East. Maybe uh, my point wasn't uh, clear. Uh, yes, China uh, is there in the Middle East, but it has not been as uh, visible and uh, influential as the United States or Russia have been in the past few decades. Um, the United States has been in the Middle East since the 50s. It has uh, military, uh, diplomatic, uh, economic alliances with many countries, with Turkey and Iran, for instance, uh, since uh, the early days uh, of the 50s, uh, in the case of Iran, until uh, the uh, overthrow of uh, the Shah, uh, with Israel uh, in the post-1967 war, uh, and its military alliance with Israel is not uh, you know, a secret, uh, and its military aid to Israel uh, makes Israel look more like a military uh, outpost for the U.S. rather than a partner or an ally. Um, the Egyptian-American relations in the post-Camp David years, the Gulf uh, uh, alliance and relations with the United States, especially Saudi Arabia's in the post-Gulf uh, War uh, scenario. Uh, Bahrain, for instance, is host to the fifth American fleet. Uh, Qatar is host to uh, one of the largest American military commands in the world. Uh, uh, America, uh, occupied Iraq in 2003 and continues to be there. It continues to be in Afghanistan. And uh, the so-called war on terror brought in the Americans almost everywhere in the Middle East. So you see their drones striking in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, etc. Only two days ago, uh, the, the new American uh, administration struck in, in Syria. Uh, so their military presence is very visible in the Middle East. And during Trump's era, there was what was called, or what was dubbed, the deal of the century. And in my perspective, the deal of the century was partially for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It was uh, more uh, concerned about the region, the whole region, the whole of the Middle East, uh, trying to undermine any regional uh, power uh, from achieving regional hegemony, something that I've just uh, uh, mentioned about America's approach towards China in, in the Asia Pacific, um, applying the same model of Merchheimer. Uh, the Americans will not be very pleased to see Iran, Turkey, or even Saudi Arabia and Egypt for that matter, becoming regional hegemons. Uh, when it comes to Israel, the relationship is very complicated. Stephen Walt and uh, uh, John Merchheimer uh, illustrated the, this complicated relationship in, in their the Israel lobby book. Um, so it, it's not, it's not uh, a region, Israel is not a natural regional power like Iran, Egypt, uh, Turkey, or Saudi Arabia might, might be considered. Uh, it's more of an American Western uh, uh, presence in the region. So the US has been there, continues to be there, and it will not allow any regional power to become a hegemony. Uh, that's why they, they have a delicate balance uh, by uh, Trump um, labels the Houthis as terrorists, um, uh, Biden cancels this label. Um, uh, this administration strikes in Syria, the other strikes in Iraq, and, and so on. The Russians have been also in the Middle East for decades, and currently their presence in Syria is very visible. Mr. Muslim, in one and, minute, please. This one, okay. then one minute. <laughs> um, their presence in Libya is also not a secret, and in other uh, countries in, in the region. China is a newcomer when it comes to military presence. Uh, yes, economic relations are there. 
there are entrepreneurs, businesses, uh, and China really needs the Middle East for energy. But militarily speaking, the only military base, and it's the first um, a Chinese uh, overseas military base, the only military base they have in the Middle East is the one in Djibouti. And it was created because of logistical problems that they had in Libya after the Arab Spring, when the Chinese uh, you know, uh, citizens had to relocate and leave Libya after the NATO stri strike the country, uh, they realized that they needed uh, some, some prisons in, in uh, the region. Will China continue to expand its presence in the region? I believe it will. But when and how, that is to analyze. They are really preoccupied with the Asia Pacific now. If they succeed in the Asia Pacific, you will see them coming to compete with the Americans and others in the Middle East more vigorously and uh, in a, a much uh, uh, more uh, aggressive fashion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Muslim. Uh, please join me and welcome, uh, welcome back, uh, Dr. Uh, Noor Aisha from the National Defense University of Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Aisha is a lecturer in uh, uh, management and defense uh, faculty. Uh, most welcome, doctor. If there are any comments, uh, please go ahead about the China-US okay, uh, okay. relation. Assalamu alaikum, Badr, and also alaykum all the experts today. Okay, very happy to hear uh, all the fantastic points and the strong information from all the experts today. And uh, it's really mm -hmm. wonderful uh, brain stimulation. And uh, what I like to say today that uh, not touched by uh, our distinguished experts today is about the power, okay? The power that owned by United States of America. As uh, you know, we always read about Joseph S. Nye and uh, he analyzed about the power spectrum of United States of America. We always see about the uh, hard power of uh, United States of America, and we also talk about soft power of America and also the smart power of America. Okay, what is different between United States and uh, China? Okay, that is very important for us. We can see that when we talk about uh, the power that owned by US, it's not only coming from the, the hard power, okay? And I, 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 we are pretty sure that China is a equivalent uh, hard power, okay? Like United States uh, right now with uh, increasing uh, technological advancement and so on. But comparing China and United States of America, okay, when you talk about soft power, how far? how far China already accumulated the sufficient soft power to become a hegemon? That is the question. Okay, and uh, when you look at it, the BRI, okay, the Belt and Road Initiative, and also sometimes we call it as OBOR, whether this OBOR is a completely economic project, this is the question. Whether China is trying to project its soft power through the OBOR. Okay, you can see that through the OBOR, they're trying to set up Confucius Center, Chinese Study Center, Mandarin uh, schools, and so on. And also they try to spread their civilization and also their culture, you know, in the host countries. So through this way, they try to, uh, what we call embedding, embedding their uh, Chinese pride and also Chinese image, okay, through the obor. But we must also realize that the Anglo-Western civilization is very old, okay? It started from the uh, time of imperialism and also the expansion of the European power, you know, to the other side of the world. And uh, it is very deeply rooted in every region, okay, like uh, in Malaysia, okay, we are very much connected to British. And when you go to India, they are very much connected to uh, British. In Philippines, they are very much connected to American. And uh, we also see that American power was, uh, you know, they projected their power starting from the First World War. Then uh, after that, it becomes stronger after during the Second World War and in the post 
uh, Second uh, World War era, especially not only in Europe, but also in Asia, especially in uh, South Korea and also Japan. Okay, so in that process, uh, we are seeing the US not only projected the hard power, but also the soft power, which they combine it as a smart power. Okay, smart power, whether uh, China can uh, achieve that level of United States of America to uh, conquer the mind and heart of the people, especially in the Middle East. And very interesting point was, uh, uh, was said by uh, the expert, Mr. Adam, the brother Adam. Brother Adam was talking about uh, who can be trusted in the international system, whether United States of America or China, okay? Especially when we talk about the Middle East nation and also the Middle East leader. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fully agree with uh, Brother Adam because uh, it's always okay for the Middle East nation and also Middle East leader to trust America as a transparent nation than trusting China as a non-transparent nation. Okay, that is the, uh, the two point, the two side of the, the character that the nation is projecting because we know very well Chinese in their civilization, they are very close society. Close society means they don't say what is real. They don't say always because they are very close. What Sun Tzu teach, Sun Tzu said, if you have thousand dollars, just show that you have one dollar. So that is the uh, behavior of China. So this was understood very well uh, entire, in entire international system. So it, uh, China has to work hard to become a hegemon or to conquer the mind and also the heart of the Middle, Middle East nation. And, uh, and also we are seeing that US has been involved actively in the Middle East, you know, Middle East as a, as a mediator, as a, you know, as a broker, peace broker in the Middle East. So it's, it's really hard to cycle in United States of America and uh, to put China in that place. It will take long time. That is the reason that the Premier Xi Jinping started the Obor to project the soft power to win the mind and heart of people through the economic channel. But also we are seeing that how U.S. is giving the challenge to, uh, to China because they know very well that this is a soft power projection and if China can win the soft power project, projection, that means one day they will have a beautiful smart power in their hand. And this was said by uh, President Xi Jinping in the, 19, uh, in the two, 2020 national period that China is not rushing to become a hegemon. He said clearly that we, we waited 5,000 years in our history and we can wait Doctor, it more. If I may, if I yeah. may conclude, please. Yeah. If I may, in less, one, in less one minute. Yes. I may. <laughs> okay, okay. That, that's all, Bader. Uh, that's all, Bader. I'm seeing this, uh, this conflict, you know, this conflict between the uh, US and, uh, and also... Uh, China, because U.S. is a hyperpower. You know, you know, during the Cold War, how they become a hyperpower when there is a competition, and now they will be more hyper with arrival of Ch China and also rising power of China in the international system, and they will try more and more to make themselves to advance themselves. You know, to advance themselves in the international system. Thank you, Bhadra. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Strategy and uh, Management Studies. Okay, that means the Defense Management Studies. Okay, thank you, Bhadra. Nice meeting thank you, you so again much, after a long time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks yeah. for your comments. Uh, if there are any questions else, please go ahead. Maybe uh, we can ask Saddam. Uh, I think Saddam has a question to ask. And uh, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe can he give us the, a good question. Already Saddam gave us a good question. Uh, Dr. Muslim, uh, answer him. If there are, uh, if okay. there are uh, another answer for Saddam question, please go ahead. Dr. Daniel, if you have any comments for Saddam. Uh, 
thanks for the Saddam question. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, if I can put a few things uh, into in, in these short times of period, uh, I think I was attracted to some of the point mentioned by uh, some of the speakers that a lot of our views and perspective has been predominated by either the West or China. Uh, but then there is a problem. If the topic is about China and US and in the Middle East, uh, perhaps the $3 million question in the context of the Biden era will be a uh, question remain if after Trump, the US is willing to work with China and what is for the Middle East. Uh, I think uh, apart from myself, the rest are all quite familiar or at least originated from the Middle East region. And it is also very important to remember when we are looking at the Middle East, uh, we have to understand there's a different facades of the Middle East, not one single narrative, uh, depending on which parts of the Middle East, either, uh, either we are talking from the political aspect, economic and so on. And that resulted from various perspectives about those Middle East uh, view, viewing China and US in particular. And I think that's very important. And number three, I think, uh, if I may sum up uh, uh, from, from some of the points mentioned by Brother Muslim uh, and Adam, as well as other speakers, uh, by the end of the day, we have to realize uh, that uh, the future, as, uh, as, the, as mentioned by Brother Muslim, uh, cannot be simply confined to the past and history in terms of how we understand whether it is a narrative of the Cold War and so on. Uh, it is not similarly uh, following that trajectory. Of course, it's getting uncertain because we can't predict the future. Uh, but what is important is uh, we're going to see a new layout uh, for the Middle East, uh, depending on the interests uh, of these two competing notion of powers. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we have to remember we have not engaged in a proper dialogue, even with China, as mentioned by the last speaker just now, with all the thousand years of history and civilization. Perhaps maybe in the future we could find those people to have a true dialogue and at least represent uh, the perspective of China. Uh, but again, uh, we also have to caution ourselves uh, about uh, the future of the Middle East in the context of the Biden era in particular. Uh, as mentioned by Brother Muslim, there is a big spectrum uh, in terms of how we have seen the carefulness of the Biden so far in responding to a lot of the issues of the Middle East. Uh, but again, uh, there is also different parts of the Middle East where some parts are very strong towards China, whereas others might be towards US, given the encroachment and intrusion by these two superpowers over the long history. In fact, before the present, which is geopolitics, strategy, uh, BRI, and more recent after or during the Cold War, uh, there is a long encounter by both uh, historically as we understood. So it's a very complex dynamics. Uh, it's important to learn from the history, but not to crack into a fallacy that everything could be simplified, that this is just another Cold War, uh, because obviously, uh, that narrative has taken the analysis so much and that blinded a lot of people to see that uh, it's a big elephant, but there's a, star, uh, there's a few blind men looking at this one big elephant in, in understanding different parts of that elephant. And that elephant is the Middle East, actually. And we are, we are not going to repeat the mistakes and uh, the fallacy of uh, looking at either one instead of considering all. And that's remain a challenge, uh, I will say that. Yeah, thank you, Bader. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniel. Thank you so much for your uh, answer and comment. Uh, if there are any questions, please go ahead. I think we have a question. Okay. Okay, this is a question for Dr. Daniel. I would like to ask how can Chinese uh, business in the Middle East help in bringing peace to the region? Uh, bringing uh, peace to the region. Go ahead, Doctor. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think, uh, again, this question is very interesting uh, because of at least uh, there is a perception that China is a solution or an alternative to what presently dominated uh, so-called US hegemon in the Middle East. But again, a lot of other speakers have carefully commented that we are talking about uh, different angles and perspective of these two encounters with the Middle East. Uh, in fact, the presence of China in Middle East in terms of security, and bringing peace is something that can be questionable or debatable uh, from both angles and perspective. Uh, 
but it doesn't suggest there is no presence of China. For example, the military base in Djibouti, uh, the involvement in Iran nuclear deals, uh, of course, with Syria, as we understood, given the ISIS complexity in that country and so on. Uh, again, there is potential. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but what is the true essence of China, if not begin with the notion of oil and gas as part of the expansion of BRI? Meaning the motivation of China in Middle East itself is not similar with the past of the US, uh, which of course US is more long during because of the long history as, uh, as part of the Western European uh, understanding as we understood so far. Uh, but we have to be uh, clear as well that when we are talking about China in the Middle East, uh, selectively, it is always based on whether the presence of China, so-called peace or not peace, uh, depending whether there is an interest. So towards the end of the day, it always, uh, whether it is something relevant to China, uh, when China want to contribute to peace and so on. And this is something very troublesome because Middle East is quite familiar with this prisoner dilemma where a lot of the foreign invasion coming from the period of ancient present and hopefully in the future, and that remain a big challenge for the Middle East because the idea of the peace is something very elusive as long as this present of foreign invasion is coming not for the Middle East, but for those, uh, whatever you have coined so far, Mosheimer, Kennedy, Rice and Fall, Big Powers and so on. And there is no true peace, at least from the Middle East perspective, because they have to play a role and this has to be uh, their position as something very small when compared to these. Uh, given the vulnerabilities and tussle of all these. So the role of the China, I would say, depending so much among that factors, rather than we could simply genuinely uh, praise that China is very useful and beneficial for all of those uh, in many ways, I would say. So that would be my take uh, upon that question. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Th uh, thanks also for Buthaina for this uh, question. Uh, there are another question. Okay, if there are another comments, please go ahead, if there are. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I think there are no questions and comments. That's meaning we, we reached the end of... Uh, Brother Muslim, I, you want to yeah, say I, something? I, I will make a very brief uh, comment uh, relating to what uh, Dr. Okay. Daniel has just highlighted. Um, I think China has a leverage when it comes to uh, its relations with the Middle East compared to uh, the United States, but it has, of course, also other things that offset it. Uh, China does um, uh, does not have the Israel problem that the U.S. Uh, has in the in the Middle East. Uh, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East is, uh, in a way or another, heavily affected and. Um, uh, um, weakened, crippled by the existence of Israel uh, and United States uh, um, role in protecting Israel. China doesn't really have any state in the Middle East that it has to protect. That's one. Um, the other thing is the ideological baggage. U.S. Uh, is perceived as the leader of the free world, the uh, democracy that has been preaching democracies. Uh, uh, preaching democracy. So they came and, and bombed the hell out of Iraq to, to make Iraq democratic. Um, now Biden uh, started to adjust his policy towards uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Yemen, and other uh, regional uh, powers and countries. And people in um, uh, the US, uh, ideological fanatics and others are, uh, you know, criticizing even before he start. Uh, China doesn't have this. China has a totally different uh, political system. They, they're not going to go to Iraq or Syria to preach Confucianism. It's not going to happen. Um, another advantage or leverage that China has in the Middle East is its uh, foreign policy decision-making uh, model or system. Uh, the Chinese uh, government is run by the uh, Communist Party, the Central Committee of the Communist Party, wields huge power. The president, uh, who is the secretary general, of uh, uh, the Communist Party uh, wields huge power. He and his advisors and, and the, the team of senior Chinese officials can actually uh, you know, uh, uh, discuss policy and execute it in a much faster pace than the US uh, can uh, do. And you see in, in, in the case of uh, the US, they implemented the TPP uh, when Trump was elected, it, it was repealed. A big 
serious foreign policy initiative was was repealed. I don't see Obor being repealed if President Xi Jinping is replaced by another president. So these are three leverages that China has. But China has uh, a big problem, which is dependency on uh, energy sources. Uh, the Middle East, uh, the Gulf, and um, uh, the oil resources of the Middle East are of essential importance for China. The US, after the energy revolution in recent years, does not really depend on uh, Middle East oil like it used to in, in the past. So China has a very delicate balance where it, uh, it needs the Middle East, uh, but it doesn't have much limitations like the US has had over the years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, future Dr. Muslim. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, Okay, I think uh, until now we reach for the end of our discussion. Uh, once again, thank you so much, our uh, our speakers, our participants. Thanks for uh, sharing knowledge and statement commentaries with us. Uh, thanks for our uh, participants for joining us and and uh, for the for questions. Uh, also, let me thanks again uh, Middle East Asia Forum to give us this chance. And please uh, joining us in next, uh, joining the Middle East Forum uh, in next webinar, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen, maybe next two weeks, next month, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Thank you so much until now. And and uh, we can say bye bye and salam alaikum. Okay, bye bye, Badr. Thank you, thank you Badr. And also thank you to everyone. As salam alaikum. Thank you, thank you very much. Alaikum salam. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. Thank you, Brother Muslim. And thanks for the other participants. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Salam alaikum. Alaikum. Salam alaikum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Brother Walter. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you, Dr. Asha.